Hey everyone, it is Irene Lyon here and welcome to this entire world of nervous system health, healing, trauma, and all things neuroplasticity. Today I have a return guest, Chris Durkees. He and I have had four other conversations in the past. Our first one was about six years ago where we dove into the topic of meditation and mindfulness. I really recommend this conversation. Today we get into working with the current state of the world, ourselves and how to stay neutral, how to stay in good, we could say equanimity with what's going on, but also the importance of not shutting down and blocking everything out. There were two words that he spoke and, and, and taught about within our chat that really stuck with me. And those two words are mercy and justice. And I really love how he broke those two down and the importance of having balance between these two. So that's all I'll say. I hope you have some time to listen and take in his wisdom, his wisdom and his teachings. And of course, all of Chris's information will be near this video so you can learn more about him and take in the things that he offers out into the world. Thank you for being here and enjoy our conversation. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome back to this channel. And I've got a repeat guest today got Chris Durkees here. I think this is our fifth. Maybe, yeah. Fourth or fifth. I should have looked to make sure, but we've done more than three. And we're back to talk about a few things around empathy, heart, core tenderness, spirituality pieces and how it relates to the nervous system. How are you doing today? I'm well. Thank you for having me as always. Yeah. It's a pleasure. People like our talk. So we just re released our first one back when we were a little younger. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> maybe we are wiser now. I would like to think that. We'll see. <laughs> um, for those that don't know you who haven't watched, listened to our past conversations. Can you give us your background, where you've been, what you do now, and um, then we'll dive into today's topics. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I work, sometimes I go by various names. I've called myself a soul interpreter or a spiritual coach, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, my background is originally as a strong spiritual practitioner and particularly someone who was training to be and eventually for a time was and then left as a pastor, as a clergy person. Mm -hmm. So I had years in uh, monastic life, I had years in seminary, I was an ordained priest for a period of time and um, in that work I especially enjoyed the rare times that someone actually came to me with questions about their spiritual life mm -hmm. amidst all the many other responsibilities and things that I had in that time. And I got to the point where I wondered, well, why don't I just do this instead of the other aspects, some of which I liked and others that were not maybe my favorite thing in the world to do. Mm -hmm. So I took a leave of absence. That's now... Oof. <laughs> uh, 10, my daughter just had her 10th birthday, so 10, 11 years ago now. Yeah. Because she yeah. was in the womb when yeah. that happened. I remember. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's been a decade. <laughs> and, um, and the folks that I work with come from maybe religious backgrounds or not, or they're into yoga, or they're into meditation, and really a focus on what I call sort of soul, which is for me the unique personal essence of someone. Mm -hmm. And then obviously your influence uh, has helped me to incorporate how to think of soul through the, and spiritual practice through the lens of regulation and the nervous system and somatics and so on. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of those factors along with some other stuff mixed in. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think about our time, because I worked with you extensively for a few years, more than a few years, when you were still in the city, 
Mm -hmm. I can remember that little office up on Main Street. And um, I would say that the work I've done with you has helped me open up into a more mm -hmm. soul, spiritual, um, centered, focused awareness, along with the nervous system work, of course. And I was I was raised Catholic, as I'm you may or may not remember. And I wish there was a part of that that I really enjoyed when I was a kid, because there really wasn't. Um, <laughs> sorry, mom. <laughs> but but I would say that now that I'm older, I do appreciate the energy if I do see a, a beautiful mm -hmm. Catholic church. Mm -hmm. One, it's a beautiful place to go and just feel quiet. And if you're in the hot summer, it's usually quite cool. So it's like a place to sit and rest and you can do that. Um, but for me personally, that element of faith didn't really ever really, it didn't resonate. Mm. Um, whereas the elements that I've learned through you with the foundation you obviously have in that more faith-based area has felt more aligned mm. and more connected with the biology, the nervous system, authenticity, purpose. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that people sometimes will say, and I'd love to get your take on this, they'll say, well, I'm, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. And then the religious people will say, well, that means you're religious. <laughs> Does it matter in the end what we call it? What, what's your take on, on this? It's mm, a great question. Um, the I like etymologies. I'm a big mm. fan of etymologies because I think they reveal kind of the original meanings of words, and sometimes yeah. we are still connected to them or we've forgotten them. Or... So religion is uh, its root is Latin, and so if you have ligio, so you have re ligio, right? Mm -hmm. And ligio would be like ligaments. Oh. So, and re means again, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. So, ideally, what a religion is supposed to do <laughs> is an organized way in one form or another to be like a ligament, to link us back, re, yeah. in that sense, to what we might call the source or the sacred. Mm. So, if that's functioning in that way... Yeah then it's serving its purpose, in my view. Um, oftentimes, I think how it usually probably works in the history is there's some person or persons who actually are connected to spirit, mm -hmm. who are actually in some way legitimately inspiring. Mm -hmm. They're connected to spirit means like the force like you can actually feel in a person who's quote unquote got the spirit or the spirits in them yeah you can actually feel that it's not just a mental thing like something's actually transmitting yeah a bit of a force yeah. field or something in their presence yeah. so usually you get a person or two who are genuinely connected in some way or plugged in and then people become charismatically drawn to these individuals. They're classically like prophet mm -hmm. figures or gurus mm -hmm. or, you know, mystics or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then everybody gets hanging around this person or persons. And then they want to figure out a system right. to try to replicate what they got going on. Right. Right. And maybe the initially it works pretty well or... It naturally attracts people who have a similar energetic disposition to whoever that figure or founder or founder figures are. Yeah. And so it kind of works for a while, but then maybe like two or three generations later, we kind of forgotten or maybe have lost a bit of touch of like what the original root inspiration was. Mm -hmm. And now the customs and the rules and the practices sometimes which were originally a means to an end sometimes yeah. start to become an end unto themselves and that's usually what people's variation of what they think of as the bad side or the 
unpleasant side of religion that they want to not be identified with and say they're into spirituality and stuff. That's a great answer. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting about ligio, because being Mm. someone who studied anatomy, ligaments connect structure together. They connect the bones together. Um, And they're essential. What's interesting to me, what you just said there, is I then think of parallels in the health world Mm -hmm. where things have started with a good purpose and then eventually it's like that game of telephone when you're in a room and you say something into someone's (laughs) ear and then by the time it gets, it's completely not what it was at the beginning. Yeah. And right now I am seeing, and I'm certain you and your wife see this because I know you're holistic in the way you live in eat and are in nature but that original do no harm you know the physician was there to really heal to be a healer to make sure the human patient gets better and if we just look at say pharmaceuticals for say psychiatry i'm seeing slowly more and more um not lots but I follow some people on Instagram, as I do, whom are trained psychiatrists who have realized how much harm their psychiatric meds are doing to their patients. Now, I'm not saying that all medicine is bad um, and that some pharmaceutical meds aren't good for certain things. I'm not saying that, but I have worked with enough people to know that these are doing harm And then I think of the education system that you and I were probably raised in and how that has created so many people that are afraid of creativity, afraid of making mistakes, which I see in my course. And I'm sure you see that in your practice. And then we have the family system that hasn't allowed little humans to express and be their own authentic self while still teaching right from wrong. It's like as soon as you started to say that, my mind just popped all these little lights of where actually this organized way of shifting things into a little package has lost that full essence. It's like taking a potato from the ground and now it's a French fry at McDonald's that doesn't even resemble food. Yeah. It's almost a, this is almost like a macrocosm for every single piece that we would say has gone a little sideways in our civilized human nature which sounds quite depressing and yet yet, on the and yet here we are (laughs) the spirit part of it in terms of people saying they're into spirituality yes to me at least emphasizes there's always a possibility for a fresh you know reboot there's always Mm -hmm. the possibility for a direct connection we might have to there might be a bunch of barnacles you know, <laughs> that have kind of hung on to the side of the ship or whatever that might need to get knocked off a bit. But yeah, the possibility of organic life and like real wisdom and intelligence being available is certainly not, I think, and it'd be longer defined by what culture someone was raised in and religion officially, yeah. traditionally or not. You know, I think that's broken down there's pluses and minuses but it's that that ship mm-hmm. has sailed mm-hmm. i have a curiosity my, it's a personal question mm. do you pray in the way that you were potentially taught during seminary or is has has that shifted or do you do like kind of a chris hybrid version of all the things you've gathered probably a little bit more of the hybrid but but there's some of it that's still yeah. very much the same um i was always really drawn to silent prayer mm-hmm. uh what is sometimes called the prayer of presence or contemplative prayer in the way that i grew up mm-hmm. which is not particularly wordy and doesn't some we went back in like the mindfulness way back i think our first one yeah. we were talking about yeah practices that are oriented to creating concentration and focusing mm-hmm. attention mm-hmm. 
So a prayer variation of that would be like a mantra, which yes. was a prayer practice that I actually practiced for a number of years. Um, the repetition of a sacred phrase usually or sound mm -hmm. that will concentrate attention. Mm -hmm. And then there are other styles of meditation or prayer that are to allow attention to go more non-focal, mm -hmm. like wider, mm -hmm. usually like in a Buddhist way, you'd call that mindfulness or something. Mm -hmm. But in a prayer form, it's actually just to like empty and just be with the present moment and just have a kind of deeper than words sacred intent and just to be in presence there's a great story about mother Teresa, where the interviewer mm. asked her what she says when she prays and she said i don't say anything i just sit in silence and listen so the interviewer said okay well what does god say she says well god doesn't say anything god just sits and listens <laughs> she said and before you ask me <laughs> i don't know how that works but it does that's just how it is. Right. And that style is probably more the way. Because I kind of think of it more like over time it was first I taught like techniques of how I'm supposed to pray or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But over time I kind of think of it more like the divine is the one praying. Mm -hmm. And to me there's kind of a prayer going on which is life and I'm just trying to get myself in line with that thing that's already happening rather than I do something and then I achieve something and I get yeah. somewhere and whatever Yeah. this push pull wait and see will my, aunt, will my prayers be answered if I just sit here versus not taking action towards mm -hmm. things. Um, and there's classic. prayers of, yeah, yeah, and there's all kinds of different classically emotional states. Um, a prayer of gratitude. Normally people are taught to think that prayers have to be like petitions, you know, <laughs> asking for something or this is going bad or please God make this go away or whatever. Yeah. But it's also possible just to sit in glory, like in just mm -hmm. appreciation of like, wow, let's look at these, the sky and the clouds and the trees. And that's a prayer, you know, a prayer of um, lament. Mm. Things are sad. There's plenty of sad stuff to mourn and be sorrowful about. In the Bible, there's a thing called the Psalms, which are these prayers. And some of them are just like people raging at God, right? Like, what's wrong with this? Why are you doing anything about it? Look at all these people suffering. This is horrible. Like, that's a genuine experience. If that's yes. what the person wakes up with really feeling, that's the prayer. Instead of, oh, holy, I need to say the right holy things, blah, 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 blah. Meanwhile, it's like, what? You know, WTF. Like, there's like a <laughs> lot of that. So it could be like a prayer that's about injustice and a sense of some you know divine rage or wrath you know yes. it could be more lament it could be joy and celebration when that's appropriate it could be contentment and rest it could be i'm really scared yeah you know um so i think the more people get out of a notion that it's supposed to be one way Mm -hmm. whether it's a meditation form or whether you call it a prayer form I think to me what's really important is the transparency it's like this is the honest experience of my being in this moment and to be radically with it and if it's a prayer sense like offer it up like here's what's real Yeah, it's naked it's not hiding and it's not doing the I'm the good religious person doing the good thing and saying the good prayers or whatever is like no actually today's rough or today's beautiful or this mm -hmm. moment is a lot of confusion mm -hmm. and that's precisely where to be met i would say by wisdom i want to go back to something you said at the beginning mm -hmm. about force you said mm -hmm. this force that we feel 
Mm. And I want to I want to extra this is like a pick your brain moment because I've had this more than once from um, outside sources whom I, I won't say that they've stopped learning from me because I don't know if that's true. I don't know. It's not me to, to ask, but mm. they have considered or have mentioned their suspicion of going on with me because they will, again, these, these aren't my words, but they will say I'm Christian, mm. therefore I don't believe in energy. Mm -hmm. and um, or I don't use life force energy I, I don't know where that's coming from but I'm going to give you what I think it might be mm -hmm. and I'd love to hear your take my mm -hmm. sense again I don't know if this is right but um, that, that God is a person that is in charge of things and that it's, it's external my experience is I've become more regulated, and a lot of our students say this, is as I've become more biologically sound, healthier, not perfect, but by any means, but more in tune with that environment that you just said, to just look at the trees, and that they have said they have felt more spiritual, more connected to this force. To me, it's very Star Wars. I know you and I are of that generation. <laughs> right. you know. I can't help, and I've gotten in trouble where I've been on, I was on one Christian podcast, mm -hmm. and I guess I made the mistake of saying my belief in God is force and source, mm -hmm. and I believe in the unity of this energy that binds us all together, not my words, <laughs> you know, Yoda and right. Obi-Wan's words, and also Darth Vader's words, you know, this telepathy, telekinesis, um, and I actually got, got the, the podcast, they decided to not run it because it did not align with their audience that I said mm. that. And I kind of felt a little like kicked to the curb. I'm like, but this is mm. really good nervous system regulation work that your right. people would probably really enjoy because I have had many, um, they would call themselves Christians in the course and, and their view is this is strengthening my connection to God and they're not worried about me using the term energy and, and source and force that binds us. So I'd love to hear your your thoughts on that, because it has been something that I've been genuine. I don't get mad at it. I'm just like, hmm, that's interesting. Yeah, um, there's a lot of different flavors of religion overall. And then there's a lot of flavors of Christianity as one flavor of the various mm -hmm. religions. And then there's yeah. lots of sub flavors within Christianity and some would be more open generally speaking to that kind of thing and some might be a little more uh, closed off right. perhaps so when people say they're Christian you actually kind of need to like sift down like well what flavor what style what denomination what's the right. belief system there but yeah, there's a branch of Christianity. It's not the branch I was raised in, mm -hmm. um, certainly, which is tends to. It was kind of a long theological argument here, history behind it, but generally, that I would say sees human nature as very evil. Evil. And, yeah, or at least profoundly disturbed and broken mm. it's a pretty dark other views would see it more as there's maybe some wounding right but the basic nature at its core is good even if there's some challenges that need to be worked through but others really i would say tend to have a view some would disagree with me but it's an argument it's an ongoing argument it's been going on for a good 500 2000 years depending <laughs> yeah um but I tend to see those perspectives as looking at human nature as in a very fearful way mm. and in a very disgusted kind of way. Like, were these like very disgusting things? And in that view, salvation or redemption or something really has to be this kind of divine rescue operation. Because mm -hmm. the system isn't just kind of 
needs has some wounds or some flaws and needs a little bit of healing like it's pretty well corrupt from right at the core right. and therefore something external is going to have to come in and basically extract us from that system save save the situation so any talk about if that's someone's view that they really have this view that human nature is really not just wounded but like pervasively corrupt and corrupted they're maybe not going to be super up for the idea that we can transform our aggression into healthy boundaries or Mm -hmm. the idea that like our desires can actually lead to positive places i mean that's a christian version but you can get something similar yeah in a lot of other traditions it's not unique to christianity where the body emotion sexuality human feeling even human relationship think of all the different traditions that really idolize this idea of like being a hermit right or a yogi who's gone off and lives in a cave all by himself or wherever you know that's can very easily lead to the idea that like time mortality our human feelings are things to be transcended right are things to be negated right there's this subterranean thread through a number of traditions that is more the one that i look to be kind of connected to and it goes by different names and different traditions like mm. Some would call it alchemy, some call it tantra, some call it Kabbalah if they're Jewish, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. But it's the notion that that those raw states, mm-hmm. that raw fuel of our primal natures, of our desire and our aggression and our celebration and our heartbreak and our fears and griefs and everything, that that's exactly where the action's at. That's not the negative stuff that we're trying to get rid of mm-hmm. in order to be the good, nicey, nice religious person or a spiritual person or whatever. But actually right at the core of that stuff, if it can be liberated, if it can be transformed, that's where the juice is at. That's where the alchemy takes place. Base metal to gold. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm from that school which are admittedly historically the ones that are fringy and marginalized and the the heretics and usually (laughs) the wild cards of the rebels and they get in trouble and stuff but yeah but to me that's the that's where the fun is at um when we're recording this you and i in january i'm gonna date this but um, soon there will be a video released on my YouTube channel that when people watch this, it will already be there. So we'll link it. And um, were you ever a Stranger Things watcher? Did you mm-hmm. ever get into that show? Mm-hmm. Did you finish it? I didn't get all the way through. I think I watched the first couple seasons. Okay, so this will be a spoiler alert. <laughs> 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 we'll make it very general. But towards the end, it was very clear that the monster or the thing mm. the, on the on the upside down, mm. it was preying on people's trauma. Mm. It was preying on the people who were staying in substance abuse, right. who were avoiding the bad things that occurred, who were only resourcing to positive, light, airy, mm-hmm. good, juicy stuff. Mm-hmm. And there was, I actually just got shivers thinking about it. There's a very, very uh, specific scene towards the end where Max, girl, red hair, Mm -hmm. lost her brother Mm -hmm. to the monsters. And she found a song that she loved Mm -hmm. that um, got really popular last year or two years ago. It was the Kate Bush song. running up the hill and Mm -hmm. it's actually to god i think that's Mm -hmm. so it's everywhere and a lot of people don't know that's why that song got so popular again (laughs) and that was what helped her Mm -hmm. when she was getting anxious Mm -hmm. and 
the trouble with that is she was resourcing so much and avoiding the pain and the darkness and the monster found her hiding in the light mm -hmm. and she had to rip away from that resource and in, it, in the end she was fine she was fine um but seth and i my husband we did a little short video on that mm -hmm. and the importance of confronting our monsters which you and i talked about um in mm -hmm. our first talk mm -hmm. the gremlins the monsters all those pieces yeah. so let's shift gears to that because mm. some of the write-ups we had back and forth before we got recording today was around this element of feeling what's going on in the world not denying it not shutting down from it but also maintaining i think our sense of self and not getting lost in the chaos and my experience is um, those who are still not in good enough practice with their nervous system, with what we might call a, a spiritual practice, a, a nature-based practice, they are getting very much lost. And there's so much doomsday, dystopian mm -hmm. worry. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the world's got its problems. And how do we know those but still stay active and in flow i don't even want to use this the term grounded and centered because we still need to be moving and, and doing and creating and being with our families um so let's dive into that topic and how you've been seeing that because as as you said to me in your your email um, and i quote <laughs> um <laughs> Let's talk about something about how to maintain an open heart, not shutting down, not getting overwhelmed, maintaining joy, courage, generosity, etc. When things are as weird, wild, and wonky as they currently are. Yeah. So. They are that. Yeah. As well as some other things. But, um, yeah, I, and this would be, in the positive sense, influence from my Catholic upbringing that I really appreciate. Yes. There are these nuggets that I still hold really dear, even though I'm not in the same format. Mm -hmm. And one of them is certainly the Christian mystical path is one that's definitely oriented to heart. And it's definitely oriented to, it's not exclusive, that that's not unique. It's not the only one that is, obviously, but um, but there's a deep emphasis on our individual paths should be part of something greater than ourselves, mm. and that that's just intrinsic. That's not an add-on. That's not a question of like, do you want to check the box of also caring about other people or not? Like, it's an it's not an optional right setup. It's it's built in. It's Absolutely. Yeah. And I appreciate that. And within that, for example, there's a teaching I grew up in called the um very Catholic language you may call this the yeah. the works of mercy and the works of justice. Oh. And these two are kind of left and right hand. Hmm. And everybody's gotta kind of find their combo. So a work that's more mercy oriented might be like visiting a friend who's having a really hard time and yeah. bringing them dinner and doing their laundry and just sitting with them, mm -hmm. bring some flowers, brighten up their day Yeah. or visit someone who's stuck in the hospital or stuck in an elder care home and doesn't get out and it's lonely, Yeah. you know? Yeah. So those are kind of very merciful acts. Mm-hmm feeding someone who's hungry. Yeah. Justice acts are, why are there so many people hungry? Right. Okay. Like not like, oh, we got to feed more people. Oh my God, we need another soup kitchen. Oh my God, we need another food bank. Hold up. Why are there hungry people? Mm -hmm. So we need to both, right? Because mm -hmm. otherwise, if we're just doing all the mercy stuff and there's no justice, then nobody's attending to like what's the source of the the pain here. Yeah. 
and just justice sometimes sides without a lot of mercy yeah. or empathy or compassion can be pretty harsh. Yeah. Can be pretty puritanical. So everybody's got to kind of, for me, find a balance. Mm-hmm. Some people might have more gifting in one way or another, but we need to at least be aware of both and mm-hmm. find some combination of the two. Mm-hmm. And I find with your emphasis, like you said, on doing and creating, that's a better way, I think, to frame and look at the issue than what is it you're reading online and is getting you all stirred up and then you have no direct influence on and then you feel collapsed and despairy because there's nothing you can do about it and it's a big, scary, overwhelming world and that's not helping anybody. Mm -hmm. It's not helping the individual and it's not helping whoever's suffering that might need some support no so um i just think it's important that people find one thing just one thing that really for whatever reason draws them particularly Mm -hmm. there's immense amounts of suffering everywhere we turn in every amount of style and direction sadly Nobody can be all things for all people and solve every ill and be, nobody's got a magic wand, some superhero who can make it all go away. Like, it's there. But if someone feels particularly drawn to child raising dynamics, parenting that has a compassionate and just orientation, that's something that someone can make a difference. Yes. If it's about people who are struggling with drug addiction and somebody has training in that, there's their, like, every one of those variations are all ultimately different branches that link back to a similar tree, I think. So at the end of the day, if you, if somebody dives into one, you basically learn about the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Instead of this, thing we're doing which is backwards the social media way which is you're supposed to get exposed to everything all at once and then get completely overwhelmed with options and where to even start and what to even do and then then again people go into kind of disorientation and despair so it's better just to find something that moves your heart and find out what people are doing about it and join in yeah cleaner yeah. it's more direct and yeah 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 um i stay very much away from world events in my professional expressions online mm-hmm. and 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 that does not mean that i am not aware of what is occurring cuz i do not live under a stone in a cave and I choose to engage with what is occurring. So I am aware of the, the, we could, again, that field of energy that's, or else I won't know why someone is being quite aggressive to me online about why I'm not talking about this thing. You know, I think we could probably guess what that's about there's lots of things going on where I could be speaking about the injustice, as you said, or the justice I could do. And um, the one thing I've learned in being in this work for as long as I have is, and one of my Feldenkrais teachers said this to me when I was quite young and green. He's like, you can't, you can't save the world, Irene. You can't heal everyone. And he could see it in my eyes. I just wanted to bring this, you know, work to everyone. And, and we see that, I see that in my healing, uh, colleague community where people are struggling because they're, they're sacrificing their own well being to give away so much of their time and, and money and effort and they can't pay their rent. For example, you know, they can't hop on a plane to go visit a friend. I'm, I'm being very general and Mm -hmm. hypothetical with that but it is a you know that case of the wounded healer and the starving Mm -hmm. artist but there's also the starving um health provide health care provider you know teacher of of these things that we do so 
it, but, but I'll also say, I'll just share my personal experience. It is difficult when I see those hits towards me because I'm still a human. And then I kind of pound my fists down, you know, energetically and say, am I not doing enough? Mm. And then there's like this feeling that like the sense of the people that I help who are in the West, that doesn't count because you're not helping the people over there. And I will share something that occurred. Um, someone DM'd me months ago, would have been around October. And they said, I'm really glad that you're continuing to post your resources because I'm in a bomb shelter and I was getting caught up in the chaos of everything. And I just remembered I have to orient and feel my body and see what's around me. And as soon as I saw that, I'm like, you're fine. Don't don't let this chaotic mm -hmm. energy pull you in. Um, so I share that with you and, of course, anyone listening to this mm -hmm. who is in the healing space or you're parenting a child. That's enough you know, to, to work on the immediate things in front of you and, and know that that is enough. We can't be everything for everyone all the time. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to go into this heart piece. You mm. mentioned Catholic religion. Mm. Um, and of course, when I, it's, I associate, you know, the sign of the cross, you know, it goes right to that heart chakra. We pray with our hands here, mm -hmm. you know, we do this, hello. And it isn't just Catholicism that does that. It's, it's worldwide. It's universal. Yeah. yeah. It's universal. It's, it's, it's biological, whether you believe in chakras right. or not, <laughs> Right. <laughs> you know, and in um, at least I'll share this to bring it back to the nervous system um, in uh, in one of our forms of work. It's the work that Kathy Kane brought to me and those that have learned through me is working with an area that's called the mediastinum, mm -hmm. which is this um, heart. It's not a space. It's an actual sheath. Mm -hmm. um, like it's a gossamer sheath. It's not fascia. It's even thinner. Mm -hmm. And it it engulfs this whole heart cavity to the spine and it, it literally holds that contents of the heart. And yeah. when you tune into it, and I actually have a, a, a video on YouTube, so we'll post it for people to do it. I guide people through this. Um, there is a, a, an ability to sense a duality mm. of, of, of pain and goodness sadness and anger perhaps the, this mercy and justice mm -hmm. um and when people get into it they go wow you really can have opposing polarity feelings in this one area and maybe that is something that we can talk about from your experience and and being empathetic but not getting sucked into being so empathetically driven that you burn out, you crash and burn. Yeah. No, it's beautiful. Um, I do think the heart is the place where the seeming oppositions or the seeming dualities or the seeming contradictions or divisions that we can be mm -hmm. both completely full of love and happiness and also really heartbroken at the immense suffering and pain that's all around mm -hmm. and the joy allows there to still be lightness and celebration mm -hmm. without being disrespectful but also mm -hmm. there's no way forward and there's no way of transformation or healing for said suffering if somebody just comes in all like Eeyore, like, no, like, oh, it's terrible. Everything is awful. <laughs> like, you know, like if it's everything, like, like are the cartoon characters, the yeah. dark cloud, it's just over their head yeah. and just yeah, raining yeah. on them all day long. Yeah. That doesn't offer, that doesn't offer the possibility of any transformation. There's no, mm -hmm. nobody's drawn to that. Mm -hmm. 
And yet, it's all love and light, everything's great, I'm off in my little perfect hermetically sealed world and I don't care about all those other people. Obviously, yeah. that's a bypass. Yep. But to be really in touch with the fact that life, and you can feel it right in your heart, it's like life is actually really joyful. Mm. Like spontaneously, powerfully, beautifully so. Not in a faked way, not in a love and light way, not in a let's talk ourselves into it and put on a Instagram filter to make everything look sheeny or whatever. No, like legit to me those great spiritual teachings do say if you go to the core of life it's actually smiling it's mm. actually playful mm. and that in a strange way actually makes the heartache and the grief more poignant not less because then you're like wow we're actually living we could actually be living in this just incredibly just completely wholesome, beautiful world. Like, it mm -hmm. really is not as hard as we think it should be. Mm -hmm. It was a very... I'm very Lord of the Ringsy, So, <laughs> I'm very Tolkien. There's, um... There's a very sad, poignant moment when, in uh, The Hobbit, when Thorin is dying, and he's saying his sorries to Bilbo for you know, breaking their friendship and he got gold sickness and it took him over and he said some awful things and Bilbo was his friend. And he's dying, so he's doing his kind of confession to Father Bilbo is his last rites, you know. Right, right. And Bilbo's forgiving him, saying, you know, we're fine, you know. And then Thorin has this great line, which is, if more people were... cared more about har home and hearth and kin mm. than gold, this would be a merry world. Indeed. Mm. And I think that's really true. And I think it's important to be able to hold in our hearts the merriness, the merriment, the, the joy, mm -hmm. and the happiness and the bliss of love. Because it's going to be the thing that allows for there to be a wellspring of benevolence and goodness that does not turn away from the pain and does not turn away from and bypass the sorrow, but is also deeper than it too and isn't going to get swallowed up by it. That's the only thing that I've found yeah. that really is like bedrock, even yeah. deeper, includes, isn't going to turn away from, has the courage but is going to be rooted in something even deeper so that despair and cynicism and that kind of poison doesn't start to sort of creep in and it's like acid it just starts to eat away you know mm -hmm. at the at the root but i think the sense of blessedness and that life is actually like you said fundamentally interconnected and there is a fundamental presence whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. um that does unite and bind all beings and as humans i'd say from a nervous system point of view empathy and compassion is natural and organic to our being it's really natural for us to love mm -hmm. and want to be connected and want to be safe and want to be joyful and playful and caring for each other and a lot of what goes on is basically training that trying to train that out of us yeah sadly and so then we get very armored or there's been wounds or pains and mm -hmm. legit traumas or you know whatever it is and there's protective measures and so the moments when we come back into the more natural state where there is a sense of like real profound love it can feel a little overwhelming because it feels yeah. unfamiliar yes but it turns out at least if these spiritual teachings have something to them which i think they do at least on this point they would actually argue that that love state is actually really our natural state. And I think that's true. But we do have to recalibrate ourselves to that organic intelligence. Because if it's been turned off for a while, or if it's been significantly muted or yeah. metered, yeah. 
you know, yeah. you do get things where people go on their meditation retreats and all of a sudden they're like, <laughs> like, and they're just, and they love everyone. And, oh, everything. <laughs> you know, they get a little wide eyed, a little doe eyed or whatever. But yeah, yeah. To really be able to calibrate by daily practice to a real sense of the warm blessedness of our hearts. Mm-hmm. And that's going to include our humanness. So to me, what the heart combines is both the fact that we're capable of connecting to the part of us that's united to the to the all, call that our spiritual nature, to the universal. And we're also, like you said, still people, we're still humans with our tender emotions and our feelings and our mm-hmm. relationships and our ouchy spots and mm-hmm. our confusions and our limitations and a lot of spiritual teachings are about trying to imagine that we're only that immortal, infinite, invincible, like all these like yogis on top of a tiger, you know, <laughs> or on a throne, like it's very like, you know, it's to me yeah. more devotional and more realistic and honest to say, yeah, we've all got that parts of ourselves and we also got young parts and we also got tender parts and we've also got confused parts and for me the heart is the one that says i'm all of the above Mm -hmm. not oh this is the good stuff i want to show this is the stuff i hide and blah 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 blah. just say look here's this diamond it's got all these fascinating facets and that's the totality of our being is to be all those different parts of ourself um and i think there's something much more real about that approach. It fascinates me when I think about, um, I'll start this a different way. Um, I I get asked often why I don't create a parenting course. Mm. And um, as you know, I'm not a biological mother and I've raised animals and held babies when they've been crying and can soothe them quite quickly and been called to friends' homes when their babies can't sleep and Mm. I zoom in and so for whatever reason despite you know the various traumas I've had it's just it's I think it's ingrained in me because of the animal hospital oddly because when you watch I think there's a reason why people love animal videos you know, there's so many videos where you see like the mama beaver with the, right. the just, you know, and the licking and the cuddling, it, you know, the elephants sleeping in a pod together. And mm-hmm. it just makes you all warm and fuzzy inside when you see that. Because they're in that essence of love without knowing what the heck love is. It's right. safety, it's care, it's connection, it's teaching. This is my kin, this is my biology course I'm going to treat it well and these animals in the wild they know exactly what to do when they have their their offspring there's no confusion about do I breastfeed or do I bottle feed do I put them in a crib do I sleep with them in in the the bed like I think about that probably more than I should when people ask the parenting question or the parenting Mm. course because it shows me how far we've come from that natural, mm. organic, mammalian essence of raising our young. And the thing is, is we had that at one point because we wouldn't be here as humans if we didn't have it yeah. for many, 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 many thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. And it's only recently that these traumas and evils, if you want to call them, have overtaken and created a a sense of amnesia, if you will, Mm -hmm. in at least the mothering of our offspring to not even feel our, our instinct that's like, I want to pick that baby up when it cries. And yet so many have been brainwashed by the pediatric world you have to let that baby cry and cry until they fall asleep because they won't learn you're going to spoil them 
that programming is still so deep. Mm. And yet I've talked to many mothers who feel horrifically bad because they did that right. um, and they overrode their instinct. And then there's others that tried it for a week and they couldn't bear to do it. And then there's others that just naturally have it. And I don't have the solution other than to say, isn't it interesting how different we all are? And yet it is, we're supposed to pick up that crying infant. There's really no if, ands, or buts. Like that is an absolute. Um, so I say that because to go back to this idea of why don't you create a parenting course or, or it's mm. like, well, actually the, the parenting course is in creating your own organic intelligence, yeah. whether you do that through me or, or another practitioner or working with you or one of our colleagues, it's, it's irrelevant. The question is, is can you get back to your own impulses? Because when you do and you really trust them, you will know exactly what to do with a little human or someone on the street that you meet who needs help for example, or you hold the door for someone who's struggling to get out of the, the store because they have a walker or something like it's that empathy. It's that I need, I want to help. Yeah. Um, so that's just my little uh, thoughts. Mm -hmm. When I think about how disconnected we've got become, and I always go back to the baby. I always go back to right. that initial imprint of how the little person was cared for by their mm. primary caregivers um and people have written about this they've said if we could get this one thing right it's not just me that said this mm -hmm. if we could get this one thing right i'm thinking of jean leadloff not sure if you right. came across her book the continuum concept mm -hmm. and and she it even says on her book if there's one book that could change the world this is it and it's about getting back to that tribal way of being with our kin and our offspring. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I don't think most of us, when we talk about the spiritual parts, you know, aren't necessarily mm -hmm. going to live over in monasteries and caves necessarily. Mm -mm. Some might, but then they create like a sort of fictive kin family. But, um, yeah, a lot of spiritual teachings, to be honest, really have, there are really ones that are oriented to that intelligence and bringing us back there. Mm -hmm. And there are other ones that are really dissociative. Like, they, we just got to call it kind of what it is. Like, they really are trying to get us to transcend, go somewhere else, start with, here's what's wrong with you here's all the methods to get somewhere else yes and there are the rare teachings that say from the beginning actually the goodness and the enlightenment and the redemption and the whatever fancy religious terminology gets used the wisdom is already inherent there might be some roadblocks, there might be mm -hmm. some hindrances, there might be some stuff that's covering it up or making it a little difficult to access. Mm -hmm. But fundamentally, you're not going anywhere else. You're going to where you already started. And maybe we've gone a little off path and we're going to come back to where we began. But we're not looking to go somewhere else. We're actually looking to liberate and really fundamentally therefore trust the intrinsic at the most sort of, if you want to call it primal or primordial level of our being, the most nakedness of our mm -hmm. being, that we're actually made in benevolence, that we're actually good. Mm -hmm. Like real mm -hmm. deep down which isn't to say wiring can't get crossed and dramas and of course, again, it's not bypassing, but to me, back to this question of how not to get over, uh, overwhelmed yes. if someone is empathetic, it's to understand and really learn to trust both the power and the inherent goodness of our essential nature. And that the, mm -hmm. the combination of the two is really important. For example, in like Tibetan Buddhism, 
an example of that, there's famously two symbols that the teachers will have, and one's a lightning bolt, and one's a bell, mm-hmm. okay. which is the thunder, right? And the lightning bolt is the, okay. like, this is our, like, it's a dark sky, and all of a sudden, boom, like, lightning bolt, the skies are clear for a sec, like, you can see everything <laughs> for everything right, in glare. Right, right. And a lightning bolt or a thunderbolt is not to be messed with, right? Like the core of our being, our essential nature has a part that's really powerful and potent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the bell represents like the thunder that, you know, reverberates from the the lightning. The bell represents love and compassion. So it's the combination of... The frequency goes out. Uh-huh. It res- yeah, it reverberates and it echoes through the universe. And to me, that importance of, for folks who might be really oriented to the compassion, mercy, love side of the equation, the bell, if you like, mm-hmm. if that's very organic and natural to them, maybe they have a bit of work to like claim their lightning bolt, like really claim their, yes, you know, and others might be a little more, they really like their power stance and they could use a little bit more of the softening and the rounding out of the, the bell. The bell. Um, but to me, it's the combination of those two yeah. that's yeah. particularly important. Yeah. Would it be oversimplistic to say that this is also um, the masculine feminine or the yin and the yang, or does that not transfer to that? Yeah, yang and yin would be words. I generally don't use like masculine feminine I know we'll get their gender stuff I know I know it's it's all so but yang is nice yang and yin (laughs) are nice because we can just leave them translated but I mean yang means directive okay it means back to if you like force or Mm -hmm. directive energy so Mm -hmm. anybody male female whatever yeah whatever gender, sex, orientation, everybody's got the ability to access parts of them that go, this is what I want, this is what I'm going to do, this -hmm. is what I'm about. That's directive energy. And it can be really clean. It doesn't have to look like I'm going to get mine and I'm going to step on somebody else. Just like, this is how I want to roll. Yeah. It's a firm boundary that's healthy. Yeah. Yeah. And yin is receptive. Mm. It's to take in the cry of another or the the beauty of another or the, the gratitude mm-hmm. of another or the presence of another. It's like really take it in, receive mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. And the ability to have both mm-hmm. is really important. Yeah. If we're only got this kind of circular high degree of yin receptivity and highly attuned to others and highly attuned to environment and highly attuned to the needs of others but don't have a sense of our own clarity or center yeah, in that center. then it's very easy to get like pulled in any direction and if we're just like this and mm-hmm. we're just this kind of stoned mm-hmm. <laughs> immovable mm-hmm. object yeah. It does not have any flow or like, oh, how does this yeah. relate to what's going on over here? Yeah. That's obviously imbalanced in the other, other direction as well. And historically, sure, usually one is considered and classically more socialized for males one way and for females another way, which is probably where masculine and feminine is words that got in there, kind of came in historically. But but no, they're, they're universal dynamics within human beings, and we all mm-hmm. need to find the proper harmonization of the two. Mm-hmm. And some people would be a little more naturally predisposed in one direction or the other. Yeah. That's fine. But everybody needs to be able to have facility with both. When I think about um, the common term, I'm, I'm an empath, or I'm so sensitive, mm-hmm. I'm highly sensitive, I'm... Um, I, I look at that, of course, from my lens in the nervous system work, but of course I look at it from the lens you've just mentioned too, as I work at balancing my hard parts and my lack of softness and, 
Mm. You know, if I think about my relationship with Seth, he's definitely more feminine um, and more yin. And it's interesting to watch how we've, we're balancing each other mm-hmm. with that. Um, but if I think about the general reason why someone might be overly empathetic and sensitive to a fault to the point mm-hmm. where they are unwell, they're sick, they're dysregulated, typically, usually, <laughs> always, um, it is a result of not having that good balance during infancy and during toddler years and having to compensate. And there's so many reasons, but someone is not paying enough attention to you. So you swing one way or someone's paying too much attention to you and you don't ever find your autonomy because you're always being micromanaged, doted on. Um, There is a, it's not that there's too much love. There's too more, too much. There can be too much Caring's not even the right word, I'm losing the proper word, but not allowing a little one to find their own independence and their own autonomy is also a danger because then they they go through life trying to bulldoze mm-hmm. and look for that boundary or look for that independence and then it can swing to um, destruction or to an illness. And I'm what we've... Of, yeah, go ahead. Saying. I noticed too a lot of spiritual inclined folk who have highly empathic natures, which tend to be a lot of folk that I not always, but a good number show up at the door. Um, you know, may have been raised in families where there was a lot of chaos and mm-hmm. a lot of um, volatility, and they take on so yes. this kind of "I'll be the peacemaker, I'll be the care for the so they're a child, but they're kind of parenting." The parents. The parents who are the adults that should be the parents, right? Oh, yeah. And then that can easily get framed. And that can easily, depending on the spiritual context, can easily get kind of idolized, like valorized. That can get really like, that's an old soul right there. You know, that's, um, look at that saintly, look at that little, sacrificial, they're a little Buddha and they yeah. just love everyone and they take care of everyone. Isn't that so? And it's obviously rooted in a truth. Mm-hmm. of the deep empathy of our being but now mm-hmm. it's become survivalistically oriented to the point that it's no longer self and other yeah it's loss of self at the cost of other and now it's so i need to make sure all these other people who are acting kind of out of control i need to like calm them down so that i'm yeah. gonna be safe yeah that's an understandable adaptive survival strategy if one is in such a situation as a young person, but that's not going to be a helpful dynamic in adulthood. No. Where, because you're just inevitably going to find a bunch of people who want to be... Saved. Saved. And that's not We also well. see it in, um, this was more teachings I learned through Kathy Kane. A lot of people have heard of fight, flight, freeze, and then fawn, um, and... I don't talk about fawn as much because it really is a portion of the freeze response, but it's more sophisticated. And one thing that she was saying a while back was kids will fawn into illness, Mm -hmm. into symptoms. And at first it might not be accurate. They fake being sick. Mm -hmm. They'll say, I don't feel well. And it's a way to maybe stay home avoid school but it also is a way to get attention and be with the parent because the parent isn't present in a way but due to our strength as human beings with our psychosomatic placebo effect capacity Mm -hmm. we can start to create an actual illness that is real um and i just put that out there um for those who might have a kiddo that has these strange reoccurring Mm. things that don't make any sense and it could be a desperate cry for better attunement better connection better boundaries even um kiddos i mean you have your your two so Mm -hmm. i'm sure you've seen this like sometimes there's a little little chaos when you're setting a boundary or a rule but then when it's set when the routine is set they actually do much better um and of course, each human has a different soul, so they might 
respond differently to those boundaries or those rules. But from my experience, inevitably, they, they know that that's what they're looking for, even though they don't know it intellectually. Yeah, I was like when, when they push on a boundary just to make sure it's there, yeah. where they're doing something just to poke, <laughs> just to make sure that the bubble's there. And yeah. it doesn't like come smacking them back in the face, but also doesn't because what's scary or anxiety provoking is they go to push yeah. and there's nothing there. Yes. That's, whoa, that's not, so they'll do a move just to make sure there's something and it's like lovingly, but no, 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 that's, nope, there you go, you found the boundary. And then they go, okay, then they go and <laughs> bounce around and play again. It's like, oh, there's actually. A boundary. Whew, there's actually a membrane. You know, yeah. like there's actually a container here. Yeah. It doesn't have to be like this. Obviously, it's not meant to be rigid, but if it's chaotic, if it's too permeable, that's that gooey space is not, that's mm-hmm. not a zone of safety to then grow with. And I was mm-hmm. thinking too of, mm. you were mentioning the fawn response, yeah. you know, uh, a spiritual variation of that that you'll see a lot. I mean, I made a little tease about it earlier, but the like people who are real that that view when they get really like, I'm blissing out. Mm. That's to me a real. That's a fawn when the eyes are like because they're like deers in headlights. They're like fawns, yeah. right? Like that yes. kind of like everything's so beautiful. Like whoa, no, no, no. So something. Yeah. If we're talking about the assimilation of experience and the digestion of experience. Yeah. And spiritual experience, as we've talked about in our conversations in other ways, like it accelerates, it got transmission if people are real about it. Not if they're just reading some books and, you know, saying some fortune cookie kind of stuff or whatever, but like legit getting into the things. It intensifies and can accelerate our mm-hmm. consciousness. Mm hmm. And that can be its greatness, but it has to be properly assimilated. So even supposedly positive experiences, Mm -hmm. like people think of like negative, what they would call negative traumatic encounters spiritually, but even ones that are like super light, love filled, blissful, it's all the heavens, the angels were singing, whatever. If it's not held. Yeah in a integrated, assimilated, regulated fashion, it can just as easily cause that kind of glitchiness. I see that. I've seen that. I see that in people who think they're doing really good work. And it's a tricky one, Chris, because mm. they're really, they don't, they don't understand, um, harm might be too strong of a word or maybe not but the issue of living in that valence of spirituality if i use that term like it right. it's like a spectrum and with it comes not only dissociation cuz your system can't live in that level like it ha- again back to that yin and yang yeah the 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 lightning rod and the bell there needs to be that 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 rest, it's like the sun comes up and it, it comes down. Mm-hmm. The right. the birds sleep and then they fly and they sing. You know, they they right. have to have that rest. And um, sometimes people will ask, well, how do I know if I'm in that bypass? What are some? I mean, what are I know the things I see, but what are some of the things you may have seen? And do you ever say to your clients, "Hey, honey"? <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're yeah. actually you, you gotta <laughs> yeah dig dirt with your hands and i say that because i remember i'll never forget and i was so grateful that one mm. of my assistants said to me in my se training she just said honey you've been in functional freeze your entire life mm. it was like a, it was the time for her to say mm. you don't understand yeah. yeah how dysregulated you've been do you ever give that tough love to folk? Well, yeah, sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> it's not always my favorite moment, but no. Um, but yeah, there's a moment that calls for it, yeah. and to try to 
be as best as discerning as Mm -hmm. um, if it were specifically the case of an integrated kind of transcendental experience, let's say, where it's blissful and the lights were on and it was really... Mm -hmm. Then I would just ask kind of a general question whether it's in the so-called positive or negative categories like if a memory like that comes up or they have this image like do they feel charge mm. and I find that a helpful way to navigate because I put a lot of emphasis on equanimity which yes. to me is not the same as like not having feeling obviously or just being neutral like yeah but if there's experiences that I can think about in the past for me that were painful, there are ones that when I tune into the memory, it's like, a, I would say it's like, is it in color or is it in black and white? Yes. Like I can feel ones that are still sad memories because they were sad memories. They're never going to turn into happy memories because they weren't happy experiences. Mm-hmm. But if I turn in, tune into them, they have no juice left. They yeah. have no charge. Yeah. There's just a kind of soft sadness. Yeah. Others might feel like they're plugged in. Like, woo, that's in Technicolor. There's an unprocessed mm-hmm. experience. And that would be true whether yes. it's a supposedly negative experience of a human kind, spiritual kind, or whatever kind. Yeah. Or even a positive one. So I would just ask them, is that memory of some whatever they go on their ayahuasca retreat whatever the example is or their nine day meditation (laughs) retreat or whatever and um (laughs) take your pick whatever version of that that there is and then it's still got charge then that would be my gentle way of indicating that it's not yet fully assimilated it's not integrated yeah not fully not at least it could be more integrated and yeah then to be able to take the charge out of the memory, to like drop the story, be with the felt sense safely mm-hmm. in a titrated way, like so to pull in a little bit of the charge, drop some of our story about, oh, that was a plus experience, that was a minus, that was the highlight of my life. People yeah. say, oh, that was my, like, be- like, ooh, don't say that was your best moment. Because that was a past, <laughs> like, like what, there. it's all downhill from there? <laughs> or, like, just plateauing? Like, what? No. That was a lovely moment. You could say, sure, of course. Mm-hmm. But um, it's very easy for people to get hooked on spiritual experiences yes, and spiritual states because, again, they're trying to run away from the present moment as opposed to, yeah, when those spiritual states happen, we've had them with kind of special encounters, they're cherries on top. They're very lovely gifts, but they're not the point of the thing. The point of the thing is to be present with love. The thing is to be here in this moment. And not every moment is going to be the lights are on and, you know, it's fantastical and tripping the light fantastic. Those might, you might have those one-off moments here or there, but mm-hmm. everyday moments are actually where the action's at. Yeah. And to the degree that there's a backlog of unprocessed material of whatever experiential variety the ability to, in a healthy way, discharge and neutralize that charge so that there's just a lot more equanimity allows it to be present to this moment, which is really beautiful and wondrous in its own ways. I'm glad you reminded me of that word equanimity because we, mm-hmm. you and I worked on that in some private work with me mm-hmm. and it's been really useful and I actually haven't thought of that word until now but it has a parallel to some things I often say, which is that um, our emotions are actually neutral by design. They might bring up different states of energy, arousal, deactivation, but they're, they're neutral. They're, they're not, it's like a baby crying or a baby happy isn't thinking, oh, I'm happy now or now I'm crying. They're just doing it. Right. And we've been programmed to attach qualities and words to our emotions and our sensations. And one of the 
achievements, if you will, when someone I think is more regulated and one could say more in connection with their spirit and source is they sense the arisings of these feelings, sensations, emotions, memories with neutrality doesn't mean it's not a bit of a roller coaster ride. Right. But we don't bring more survival stress into the room with us. We might experience the survival stress of that old memory, but we're not lobbing on another dose of fear. Yeah. And from my experience, that is the practice because we do get better at it. I don't know if there's such a thing of not having our mind have a little bit of like, uh oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the question is how big and loud is that? Uh oh, you know, is it a foghorn or is it just this whisper? Um, so that's a good reminder to come back to that equanimity and that neutrality, but that does not mean that there isn't maybe intensity with those experiences. And again, from an, the kind of you were talking about here, that's heart and alchemy kind of model, Tantra model. That's why we don't need to go off to caves and we don't need to go off to other places as much as that can be fun for you know some yeah. rest and solace and sanctuary is lovely but the amount of times people say well i can't meditate because it's like all these thoughts in the way it's like well the thoughts are your meditation like mm -hmm. this that is the very thing it. to be diving right into like you're not going in somewhere else like welcome to your mind <laughs> if your mind <laughs> is currently in a state or your emotions are currently in a state yeah. where there's a lot yeah. happening they're trying to get your attention. Welcome. Now you're actually in the game as opposed to, oh, I'm supposed to get rid of all these thoughts. Then I'm going to just be peaceful. Get rid of all this emotional stuff so I can just be peaceful all day long. That's the right from the get go. We've created this fracture. Yeah. If that's the approach. Like, nope. the thoughts as they are, the emotions as they are, the sensations as they are. Welcome. This is the game. That's a great place to end, I think. Oh, good. This yeah. is the game. Um, but before we end, mm. um, obviously, thank you. It's always super, oh, thank you. super good to hang yeah. out. Um, tell people what you're doing now with your practice, with your content creation. Obviously, we'll link everything near this. But what do you, what do, you do with people, Chris? Um, I've been building up a sub stack over the last year and a bit now mm -hmm. so there's quite a bit of content on there which is my intention there is really you know i was thinking about this i really got quite serious about things and all of this when i was 16 mm. was when i really started getting so a bit young but it was at the age that that felt like i was really starting yeah. to get into prayer and mysticism so I'll be <clears throat> coming up on the 30 year <laughs> anniversary of that uh, uh, time. So it's been a good almost 30 years now. Um, yep. So to me, the Substack is here's 30 years of a guy who walked along all these various paths. Uh, I would like to try to offer back as best I can what I've learned. Um, so the vast majority of the site is for free. Yep. There is a paid variation where we go into some further stuff. But really, I want to do that as a heart-based gift, really, as a yeah. act of generosity. And as yep. just it's time. Like, I've accrued enough. It's time to, not that I've got all the answers, but there's yeah. some things that have been figured out over that time. Um, so there's a lot of audios. There's... Uh, yep. written articles too but the majority of it mm -hmm. is audios and those are where we talk about what's the lightning bolt what's the bell how to integrate mm -hmm. titration mixed with meditation and, and all this kind yep. of fun jazz and what does it mean to have a transformative conscious relationship to your anger and how does that help build actually mm -hmm. greater compassion and kindness mm -hmm. the kind of things we talk about here right there's a yeah. lot of that so Last if people step. are interested to cool. dive more into that, that's there. And then in terms of um, 
people would want to take next steps. There's some courses that have been created on some various topics that can be found through the Substack or just email me. And then I still have my one-on-one -on -one work as well. So there's a number of different, like, do you want to dip your toes in? Do you want to wade up to your knees? Or do you want to go for a little deeper dive? A little journey. Take your pick. Yeah. Cool. Super. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. For all you do in your service. Aww. Thank you. And um, we will obviously stay connected, my friend. Yay. Yay. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.